Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as we get started here and, and more people filter in, uh, I'll give a few announcements and uh, then we'll hand things over to our presenters today. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Matt Gagel. I am the Director of Programs at Montgomery History, and we're very glad you're here. Um, we, I do want to give a special uh, thank you to our presenters um, and uh, for their willingness to present today. Um, before we get started, uh, I do want to say a few things. Uh, there'll be time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so both speakers have two separate, uh, uh, two different uh, uh, avenues, I guess, of, of the same topic. So save your questions for, and we'll do uh, both speak, we'll get to both speakers at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can use the Q&A button to send those in. Um, also, I'd like to remind everyone that we are in the middle of a campaign to uh, digitize and modern modernize our oral history recordings. Um, we also have a matching gift uh, opportunity going on right now. So uh, your your dollar counts for double. Um, so if you go to our website, you can check out the uh, Save Our Voices campaign and uh, and make your your dollar count for even more. And every little bit counts. I mean, if you only got uh, a dollar, then suddenly we got two dollars. Uh, if you've got five dollars, we got 10. So um, we appreciate all your support. Um, we've received a lot of donations so far, and we do really appreciate that. But the more more we we receive, the more we can digitize and save. Um, and of course, oral histories are very unique because they save things such as regional dialects that you can't really uh, save in, in, in writing. So um, we do appreciate everyone who has, has made do a donation so far. Um, next week, we'll be having a rewind. Um, this week is Teacher Appreciation Week at, at uh, Montgomery County Schools. Um, I'm married to a teacher, so that, that uh, I appreciate my teacher, my, my wife, every every week. Uh, but uh, especially this week, as, um, as the MCPS is honoring the teachers, uh, we'll be doing a rewind on uh, the Bethesda, the com MCPS is coming of age using Bethesda as an example. Uh, Ralph Buglis put together a fantastic presentation uh, back, I believe it was last fall. It might have been the fall before. It all kind of runs together. But uh, um, on on the development of Bethesda schools before they joined uh, MCPS and how that uh, tracks the changes throughout the county. So that'll be available next Monday at 10 a.m. Uh, and those are available for one week on our website at montgomeryhistory.org slash mhconnected slash watch. And of course, we'll have a recording of this presentation available at the same spot, um, and that will be available for a week. So if you know somebody who is interested in this and wasn't able to attend the live broadcast, uh, we will have that available for review. Okay, <clears throat> that's all I've got. Um, I'd next like to welcome uh, Susan Soderberg and Eileen McGuckian. Uh, Susan's going to give us a little bit of the the history of, of uh, the Metropolitan Branch and the railroad in Montgomery County and how it's um, changed the way of life here. And then Eileen is going to join her after that to talk a little bit about preservation stories. So with that, I'm going to stop talking because nobody came here to hear me and I will hand things over to Susan. All right, Susan, let me stop my screen share for you. All right, let's see here. Give us just a moment. Oops, I think I hit the mute button right, uh, unmute right as, as Susan was. I'm so sorry about that, Susan. <laughs> All right, you are good to go whenever you are ready if you want to start your screen share. All right. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this uh, presentation is all about the railroad that goes through Montgomery County. And this uh, year we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of that railroad, which now carries freight and commuters. So um, my talk is from corn to commuters how the coming of the railroad changed the way of life in the future of Montgomery County. Susan, but, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you move oh, a little closer to your microphone? You're a little quiet there. 
Is this better? That's that's better, yes. Okay. So I'll start, uh, give a little background first. The first uh, railroad in the United States was uh, started from Baltimore by Baltimore <clears throat> businessmen to uh, get goods out to the West. And as you can see, it began in 1828, was finished in 1853 before the Civil War. They built a branch from Baltimore down uh, to Washington, D.C. next, um, and that had a, a junction going out to Annapolis as well. Both Baltimore and Annapolis were big harbor cities. Washington, D.C., of course, the capital of the United States, but uh, it had only about a third of the population of Baltimore at that time. Now, before uh, the Metropolitan Branch Railroad was built, there was, were local people who uh, tried to build a railroad going across from Washington, D.C. to connect with the old main line, that first railroad. So this is the mastermind, Francis Cassatt Clopper. He was a farmer and he had a, a grist mill and a fulling mill and he saw the value of the railroad getting to, helping him get his products to market quicker. He got and mm, he enticed William Gaither to uh, join him. He was in the Maryland state legislature and a state senator. And he was the one who got the charter approved by the Maryland government. And of course, money bags, you have to have someone who helps finance that. And he came from Washington, DC, the well-known William Wilson Corcoran. And this was called the Metropolitan Railroad Company. And we had a lot of local investors, but uh, there was a lot of opposition from the BNO itself, who uh, were looking toward building this railroad, but didn't have the finances at the moment. And we're also having labor problems. So they were impeding this um, new little charter railroad and also the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, were impeding it. So they had to give up their charter um, the, just before the Civil War. They couldn't uh, raise enough money. They did have a plan for their railroad. As you can see here, the purple line on the left, that is was the original uh, metropolitan line. <clears throat> and it's a little different from the one that the BNO uh, finally built, and I'll show you a comparison in a moment. Here we have uh, John W. Garrett, the big man of the B&O Railroad. He had originally been an investment banker and a, a merchant, and he was very ambitious. He had guided the B&O through the Civil War, and um, uh, he got the idea that this was, well, that Railroads have been proven by the Civil War to be very uh, advantageous to commerce. So uh, he thought he would bring this uh, metropolitan branch back that ran from Washington across Montgomery County. Here's the comparison of the two. You can see the original line on the left and the um, the finely built line, which we're still using today for the most part, on the right. The original line went up straight through uh, Hager, uh, Frederick on uh, through uh, met the old uh, metropolitan the old main line at Bucky's Town and then went up. The new line ends 
apparently at Point of Rocks. That's where it meets with the old main line. But today, it goes all the way to Martinsburg, West Virginia on this old main line. Now, the engineers had quite a lot of problems to overcome. First of all, the elevations, they had to raise it up 500 feet, um, the highest points being at Gaithersburg and um, Barnesville, that's Pars Ridge at Barnesville. The last part to be built was Washington, D.C., because Washington wouldn't give the permits in the beginning. They had these, all these rivers and creeks, uh, large creeks to cross, so they also impeded the progress. These are some of the engineering uh, structures. The bridge across, or the, sorry, the viaduct across um, Monocacy and the trestle across the Little Seneca which brings up the difference between a bridge, a viaduct, and a trestle. So a bridge just connects any span that connects two points. A viaduct has to have a couple or three piers holding it up, and it sits atop those piers. For a trestle, we have a triangular arrangement of steel or wood or combination. That is, it, tapers at the top for more stability with broadens at the bottom. There were also the culverts. People don't really think about the culverts very much. And these culverts were important because it kept the trains from being flooded because they brought uh, all those little tiny creeks that flood and big rains brought them under the tracks so they would not flood the tracks. And this particular culvert was constructed of stone without any uh, mortise in the stone by uh, this man, James Alexander Boyd. He was a master mason and he had the contract for all of the part of the line that went from Little Seneca Creek all the way to Pars Ridge at um, Barnesville now. This is from the Montgomery County Sentinel, uh, March of 1866. When they turned the first earth to begin th this line on Tuesday, April 17th in 1866, it was predicted by the Sentinel that not only will our people be enabled to retrieve their losses occasioned by the late war, but such an influx of population, such a rapid development of the resources of our county will follow, and such a spirit of enterprise be awakened by the construction of this road that our barren fields will be converted into blooming gardens as if by magic. And that prediction came true, and even more than that, as it transformed the county. So here is the railroad when it was finished with all of its stops. Uh, it is reached from Washington, D.C. to Point of Rocks. Of course, uh, we didn't have Union Station quite yet. That wasn't until 1906. They had a, a station at New Jersey Avenue in Washington. And down here we have the Georgetown branch. The Georgetown branch was uh, for freight only. They had quite a few trains. Twelve trains daily. Twenty. By 1893, there were 26 stops and 38 trains daily. Now, just to give you an idea, the, the population of the county um, before the railroad, we were all agricultural, growing grains and tobacco. We had water-powered grist mills. 
Um, also some flaxseed oil. The only industry in the county was over in Triadelphia there. They had um, clothing, uh, cloth mills. The biggest town was Rockville and Rockville only had about 400 people. The whole county population was 18,000. So you can see that if you didn't live in it, most of the people did not live in the town and had to, uh, were all in the agricultural business living out in the country. It took a full day to travel the mar markets down in Washington, DC, at Georgetown. So the coming of the train made a big difference to everyone. Here's how it connected. You see, here's the old main line. You follow my pointer there. And here is the line going from Baltimore down to Washington, D.C. And this uh, is the Metropolitan Branch meeting the old main line at Point of Rocks. So it formed a triangle. And soon the b and Railroad touted this line as being all, all uh, trains would go through Washington. The reason for this is the old main line was old. It was only one track. It was very windy because it ran along rivers and it had two tunnels that would have to be entirely redone. So they would send all of the trains down to Washington and then west uh, uh, to join the main line again at Point of Rocks. So there was a modernization. This is the capital, uh, the, uh, the line that, that became the cap is now, I'm sorry, now the Capitol Crescent Trail. So there was a double tracking and um, that caused uh, new bridges to have to be built and new viaducts. This uh, Waring Viaduct and the Little Monocacy Viaduct are almost exactly the same. They're all stone. And then we had uh, the modernization because of safety concerns. <clears throat> we had uh, overpasses and underpasses for vehicles and uh, people. And the new uh, interlocking system. This was caused, uh, this uh, had already started building these interlocking machines, there was uh, the, inside the towers, there were sets of levers with electrical connections that controlled the signals. There were 11 on this line and one, only one is left and it's not in Montgomery County, it's in Brunswick and it has been moved since they aren't used anymore. It has been moved uh, to the park right next to the railroad. The agents communicated by tele telegraph at first and then by telephone. Um, this was all this modernization was caused by the wreck, uh, worst uh, terracotta, which is just in the, uh, on the other side of the line from Montgomery County in Washington, D.C., where the worst accident in the history of the line occurred on December 30th, 1906. 52 people were killed and more than 50 injured when three passenger cars were stopped at the terracotta station, uh, a lot of passengers from uh, the holidays returning home. And this tra freight train came barreling into these cars and they were made of wood. So one of the things that happened after the terracotta wreck was no more wood, wooden passenger cars because the first one, uh, the rear was just terribly, uh, disappeared, was splintered. The second one split in half and rammed into, telescoped into the third car. So it was a terrible accident and it was due to a failure in the signal system, due partially to human error. Now let's get to the stations. We have Francis Baldwin, uh, who is the architect who designed all of the stations but one on the Metropolitan Branch. He was a very famous, well-known architect who designed a lot of buildings in Baltimore 
and as far away as um, Savannah, Georgia, where he designed the big uh, cathedral there. <clears throat> and this, of course, is the famous station at Point of Rocks that he designed, which was recently put on postage stamp. So this, we go through these stations, the ones with a golden uh, frame are still there. And the ones without, uh, we have lost. So we have the Rockville and the Silver Spring stations that were built exactly alike, but on either, on one on one side of the tracks and one on the other side. The Rockville station has now been turned into law offices and moved a little further away from the tracks. <clears throat> then we have the Gaithersburg Station, built in 1884. I'm going through these uh, chronologically. And uh, then the Boyd Station was a lovely station with a little tower in the, in the middle there. Then these five stations uh, were built between eight, uh, 1891 and 1891. 1892, were all on the same design with little little uh, differences in between each one, but they're almost exactly alike. For instance, the Dickerson Station, which is still there, is uh, had a triangular uh, ticket office, and the others had a square ticket offices. The Germantown Station does not have a gold uh, frame because it burned down and um, was rebuilt by the county. So using the original plans of Francis Baldwin. So that is a replica station, not the original, but it looks pretty much the same. Now, the one on the left, the Forest Glen station is the only one that was not designed by Francis Baldwin. And that was uh, by A.H. Beeler, um, who worked in, in the um, office of uh, the architectural firm of Francis Baldwin. And look at this lovely, cute little Tacoma Park uh, station. Baldwin was very versatile in his designs. And he made this uh, kind of a German looking um, and combined with the stick architecture, which is typical of Tacoma Park. And at the university station, which was in the DC near uh, Catholic University, that one is made of stone. It was the only one on this line that was made of stone. And then we had a number of little stations. Some of these stations, uh, like at Germantown, they were, um, that was the first one that was put up at Germantown um, right after the line was built, were small frame stations like this and other places. These little stations no longer exist. This is uh, the cutest one really at uh, Durwood with the little finials on uh, the roof and on the corners of the roof. They, uh, he, Francis Baldwin also uh, designed the outbuildings of the stations. Here we see uh, milk stand. These uh, milk loading platforms were built right up next to the tracks. So these big milk cans filled with milk would have to be brought up to the platform. And then when the train came, they could be loaded directly into the boxcars from the uh, from that building. The Without the stand, this whole thing here, structure uh, uh, sitting on the ground are now the waiting stations at Germantown and I believe the Garrett Park. So here's how the train changed the up county. We have new towns which um, are in highlighted with yellow here and some of the towns moved to be next to the railroad. All of these towns experienced great prosper prosperities. Here's where Germantown, which moved uh, from the crossroads at the left, one mile to the east to be next to the railroad track. That's the business center, all the stores and services. In um, 
here we have people coming up from Washington uh, vacationing and also going to the uh, summer camp meetings at, at uh, Washington Grove. This is agriculture before where we grew a lot of wheat and uh, tobacco. And here's what uh, agriculture looked like afterwards. We had changed to apples and peaches and milk cows because milk and fresh fruit could be transported quickly to Washington, DC. We also uh, had the grist mills built next to the tracks and um, the spent cows would be sent uh, um, to Washington, to Chicago, bought up from the uh, farmers. They couldn't produce milk anymore or the uh, young male calves that weren't wanted. These were bought up by people like Herman Rabbit and sent in cars up to Chicago where they were slaughtered. We have new factories. The, here's an example of some of the factories um, and lumber yards. We had stores. The belt wire har hardware and the belt um, mercantile are still with us. And the Waters Thrift Store in Germantown, very typical of stores in the up county, uh, was burned down. And down county, we had the suburbs, new railroad suburbs, where people who worked in Washington, D.C. could come up on the weekends and in summer. And a lot of these uh, places became permanent homes. Here you have a list of the railroad suburbs coming up from Washington, starting with Tacoma Park. These railroad suburbs were very posh. They built uh, grand homes that would last, um, as I said, that they would very often get, um, uh, have, have a, a year round. The mother and children would live here and the father would come up on weekends um, or sometimes he would just make a daily commute. The, Suburbs uh, of Tacoma Park and, Rock, and around Rockville tended to be more middle class. And we'll talk now about Silver Spring. This is the Silver Spring Station in 1919. Francis Preston Blair influenced um, and getting the railroad built through his property of, of Silver Spring rather than on the old Metropolitan Branch Survey. So this became the central station because it had a lot of access to trolleys and roads. And it also um, later did um, was uh, promoted commerce. Now, um, it still was named Sligo, though, until uh, the grandson, E. Brooke Lee, finally began the commercial building and uh, development around Silver Spring. And then a new station was built in, a, in 1944. So this is the comparison from the same viewpoint of the Silver Spring station and the tracks in 1919 and in 1994. Here's the new station right here. So here is a picture of the train today. Um, and all of its connections. Here's a, comes down from Baltimore and then the line goes as it did before. And there's a line going up to Frederick as well. Connects with the Virginia railroads down here and the Pennsylvania railroads going north from Baltimore. It was taken over by uh, the CNO. I don't know how many of you remember this uh, little kitten with the CNO railroad uh, logo. And then that was then taken over again by CSX Transportation.
<clears throat> there have been a number of uh, accidents on the train. This every time there is an accident, there's an improvement, of course, in the um, rail safety. There are some things that people are should be aware of about train safety, and we have um, lost some people being hit by trains because they didn't know these these several points. The train cannot stop quickly. It can go either way on either track. The sound of one track may mask the sound of another coming from the other direction. And um, a train may sound further away than it actually is because of weather conditions usually. So here we have the train today and um, operated by the Maryland Transit Authority. The tracks are owned by CSX Transportation and the Maryland Transit Authority, MTA, operates the Mark Brunswick line along this uh, track. So three of these trains go all the way to Martinsburg. And there um, used to be an extra early train on Fridays and I think they're gonna be bringing that back, but it's still, nine eastbound and nine westbound trains in the afternoon, a total of 18. And plus the Amtrak, which comes, so, comes through about four o'clock in the afternoon. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Eileen. This um, tells you some uh, three of the books that you can uh, read if you want to know more about the Metropolitan Branch and more about the B&O Railroad, especially the Impossible Challenge 2, written by Her Herbert Harwood, and a fairly new 2003 edition about e Ephraim Francis Baldwin, and then, of course, my book, which you can purchase from the Montgomery, from Germantown Historical Society, germantownmdhistory.org. Yeah. So, Eileen, you want to take it over from here? All right, just a second, folks, while we make the transition here. Let me see if we can get Eileen working here. Ooh. Go back. There you go. Sorry. Go I back to the beginning. I I didn't there's mean, even I didn't one sorry. more. Yeah. Okay, okay. So am I changing it or I'll, I'll just saying, say next I'm, slide. I'm I'll charge. just say next slide. Okay. Okay. So um, this is going to be a um, an outline of um, and preservation stories, uh, taking it off from Susan's history and uh, and bringing it up to the present day. And of course, you you know that railroad history really parallels American history and Montgomery County history. So here, after World War II and the growth of the federal government and the increase in density of suburban areas started um, with the train, as Susan said, the Montgomery County population is multiplying. So by 1940, just before the war, it is um, almost um, 84,000 in population. It doubles in 1950, and it doubles again in 1960 to um, almost 341,000 people. And today, of course, we have more than a million in population. The competition that the railroad had was first from um, trolleys, uh, which were almost all gone by 1940, and certainly from the automobile, uh, starting from the, the turn of the of the. 20th century, but really by the 1920s, it was major competition. And then happening along the Met line, as partly as Susan said, that um, some of the trains were raised by um, the B&O for various reasons. For example, Boyd's and Buck Lodge, um, when double tracking was uh, necessitated, uh, came through um, to accommodate that by uh, tearing the stations down and adding a, a, another width on the on the track. Um, we hope that's not thinking about happening uh, for a third track, although you hear it every once in a while, and that would that would be dangerous to uh, some of the current stations that we have. 
but um, the BNO um, eliminated some smaller stations and waiting shelters, uh, just as people stop using them so much. Uh, Randolph Durwood, Tuscarora, for examples, and um, they often just left the just closed up the buildings and left them to uh, just to be there. And sometimes um, people found them and helped demolish them, and sometimes the BNO actually demolished them themselves. So as Susan uh, showed you the various charts, but to put it together, um, Amtrak was formed in 1971 to provide the long distance um, passenger services. The state of Maryland took over full control over the commuter rail service in 1984, and they named it MARC. And the CSX Corporation came along um, in 1987 as a merger of the former BNO, CNO, and Western Maryland Railroad. So you have everything compiled. So today you have uh, the um, state of Maryland trains, Mark, and then Amtrak as well, uh, riding on CSS X rails. So I just um, pulled out a sampler of stories with three specific stations to give you an idea of how complicated these closures were. Um, and um, and and um, you know the the situations that happened. So go to the next, please. We'll first take a look at Germantown. Can you advance to the next slide? Okay, good. So here is um, here are pictures of the Germantown station. Um, and the, the one on the far left is the way the station looked originally and, and after a few years. And um, what happened is that like Tacoma Park, um, and in fact, on the very same day as the Tacoma Park station um, in 1978 was destroyed by vandals by fire, um, the same thing happened in Germantown. So the, the picture on the right um, show commuters still using uh, the Germantown stop but it hadn't been, been built by um, um, not immediately after that. Go to the next slide and you'll see the rebuilt station, uh, which was reconstructed by the county. It's a replica and it's, um, it's, it's adorable and it is used daily by commuters. So um, the stations, by the way, um, on, on, the, um, on the line, um, most of the, the, the whole line is a, um, in a Maryland heritage area. Um, and um, all the stations along here are, are part of a, a transportation trail and championed by Heritage Montgomery. Um, so um, all three of the stations that I'm showing you are designated Montgomery County historic sites, historic landmarks, and both um, of the next two, but not Germantown, are on, also on the National Register of Historic Places. So go on to the next place. Um, so Rockville. Uh, Rockville is um, the um, mirror image of Silver Spring and vice versa. Um, it, um, uh, the picture on the left is how it looked um, at the turn of the, the 20th century. So it's, it's real, you can still see it pretty, pretty clearly there. It is facing the tracks as is uh, the, the freight station next to it. What happened is that Metro was planned um, in the 1970s and where they were proposing to lay track um, was where this station stood. So the proposal was to destroy this 1873 station. There was a tremendous citizen outcry. Um, the station uh, became quickly became a um, city of Rockville local historic district. Uh, we got it on the National Register of Historic Places. We um, lobbied very heavily, and by we, uh, this is the first project that Peerless Rockville was involved in. Um, and in 1981, the station was um, uh, put up on this, um, this apparatus that you see on the right-hand side and, um, and moved not very far away, 30 feet um, to the south and 30 feet to the west, but turned around away from the tracks to face High Street. And um, one of my favorite stories about this is that the contractor, uh, William Patron, who uh, was assigned to, to do this, put a, a cup 
on the one of the ledges of this train station and he filled it half full with water and he bet me a hundred dollars that it would not spill on the travel so he never made me pay the hundred dollars but not a drop spilled I and mean, he did a wonderful job of doing that so it was turned around um, then wamata sold the station to the highest bidder metro opened in um, 1984 if you go to the next slide um, Metro opened in 1984. That was the last part of that line. Um, Twin Brook and Shady Grove opened at the same time. And the station has been owned ever since by um, private owners. Uh, it's a law company that, that um, very much respects the building's significance. And here they are um, uh, 25 years ago, um, touting banners uh, that show that they're proud of, of the 125th, 125th year. So go on to the next example, which is Silver Spring. And as you know, the original Silver Spring station, uh, which was built in 1878, five years after some of the others, um, was a mirror image of Rockville. In 1936, this stop became the connection to the Midwest, to Chicago and to traveling West. Um, in 1945, um, it was deemed um, necessary to build a, a little bit different station, a more modern station. Um, so it was rebuilt to look like this station here. And it, it remains one of the very few of this era that are left in Maryland. Um, over the years, um, the maintenance faltered um, by, by the B&O, but it was kept open for Mark and for Amtrak. And frankly, they kept building the, um, the, the um, um, vertical uh, dividers between the the um, train master, station master, and the public to protect them from as they sold tickets and had people leave. But um, a um, an occasion in 1997, somehow a a car, an automobile jumped the um, jumped the path on Georgia Avenue and crashed into the front of the station. So this is a picture of it being having being boarded up soon after that. CSX wanted to demolish the station. Again, there was a major citizen outcry, this, this being all over, and especially in Silver Spring. And Montgomery Preservation um, uh, MPI um, stepped up to take ownership and um, raise public and private funds to restore the station to the way it looked in December of 1945 when it opened up. So um, that meant, um, you know, total um, redoing of the inside, um, but it was cleaning up the uh, station maester's office. It was cleaning the floors. It was uh, the women's club donating to uh, redo the uh, the, the seats and, and so on, uh, and people returning the clocks, the phone booth, the bulletin board, because they thought the station was going to be demolished, they returned it um, so it could go back to its, its um, 1945 appearance. So now it is, um, it is open for public programs, um, first Saturday of every good weather month, um, uh, including next Saturday. It has an open house there. There are events there. There are rentals available for the station. And um, I'm showing you on the right-hand slide, um, the I call it a postage stamp, not even a quarter of an acre that the station is on. But starting maybe as early as this summer, certainly by the end of this year, the Metropolitan Branch Hiker Biker Trail is going to start construction through this tiny property. Um, and that will be yet another challenge, but the station is going to remain with all of its programs. So um, the, uh, again, the, um, the entire Met line is a Maryland heritage area in Montgomery County under the theme of transportation trails, and it's championed by Heritage Montgomery. Heritage Montgomery is a co-sponsor of one of the major events of the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Met, uh, which is a, state, a train excursion that goes from Silver Spring to Brunswick and brings the passengers back um, on Monday, May 29th, Memorial Day. So you can find um, all about the uh, 150th um, celebration exhibits in libraries right now. Uh, you can find out about the various programs, um, which are Susan's programs um, and, um, and talks. Um, library exhibits, um, lectures, there are performances, uh, various um, 
communities um, are, have exhibits, have um, programs, have talks, have um, scavenger hunts, all sorts of things going on. And all of those are listed on the calendar of www.montgomerypreservation.org. Um, so um, this is our last slide. And um, Susan and I thank you very much for listening and we welcome your questions and comments and um, we'll do our best to, to answer. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you both so much. Uh, Susan, if you wanna turn your camera back, camera and microphone back on there while we, uh, we get to the questions here. All right, so again, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button and uh, those will come to me and um, our panelists will do their best to answer. Okay, uh, so you kind of, you touched on, uh, Susan, you touched on this very briefly, but can you uh, clarify where or what terracotta, where it, it was uh, as, as shown on the 1893 map in relation to today? Well, <clears throat> terracotta is, uh, there's still a street there uh, right to the south of, of the line that separates uh, Washington, D.C. from Montgomery County, and it's um, just, I believe it's Blair Road. So terracotta was a, a terracotta factory. They made these clay pipes that were used for all kinds of things back in the day, and um, it was uh, also a stop for people going to the northern um, part of, of Washington, D.C. The next stop on the line was the uh, university stop. So those were the two stops before getting right down to Union Station that uh, served the people. Um, any other questions about terracotta? I didn't see on the other ones, uh, although we'll okay. see if any come in exactly. Um... So uh, who are the laborers who did the building and laying of the track stations? Was it immigrants, uh, enslaved yes. and free blacks? Mainly it was immigrants. This was the period right after the Civil War when we had a great influx of immigrants, both from Germany and Ireland into Baltimore, uh, also Italy. So uh, there was work uh, on the railroad and of course the Former enslaved people also worked on the railroad as well. All kinds of people at those railroad camps. And fights often broke out. <laughs> uh, so one of the houses shown said Hollerith House. Is that the same Hollerith who created the 80 column uh, computer punch card? I'm sorry, the which house? The Hollerith. Oh, H -O yes. Um, uh, in, in Kensington, is that? I think Garrett Park. Garrett Park, yeah. Do you know uh, the answer to that, Eileen? Um, um, I can't speak for Garrett Park. I do know that Herman Hollerith had a, a um, weekend and summer home on the Rockville Pike. Um, and it is that Hollerith that you're speaking of. Um, but uh, we'll have to ask Garrett Park folks to answer that if it's the specific one. I suspect it is. Pretty uncommon name. Okay. Uh, did Baldwin design the Washington Grove Station? Yes, uh, he did. That was the only one that he did not design was the one um, in uh, Forest Land. Okay. Uh, uh, attendees asks, where was the Linden Railroad Station located on the uh, on the line? Well, right where they've just replaced that bridge, um, just south um, of Lintonsville. Yeah, Lintonsville, just south of Forest Land, okay. or south of Wood uh, Woodlands. Also, the the stations were very close together there. Mm -hmm. So Linden is the earliest uh, actual um, railroad suburb. I think I can get that page. So and there is a Montgomery County Historic District of of uh, properties in in yeah. Linden. Um, there was, um, not not too far from from uh, St. John's uh, uh, Church. 
Well, St. John's Church was designed as well by Francis Baldwin. That's right. <laughs> so uh, Linden was the first one in 1873, uh, developed by Charles Keyes on uh, 32 acres. And the next one to be built was Tacoma Park. Okay. But, but they uh, all had these wonderful advertisements. Um, get out of Washington that had that had uh, malaria and mosquitoes. Um, you know, live out here. You can the the father can commute to to Washington, which used to take hours and hours to do, and now you can you can just get down there in a few few minutes. Um, you can go as far as Boyd's, wow, and be out in the country um, and and. Um, having a weekend or, or a week away, uh, you could come out to uh, the beautiful Woodlawn Hotel in Rockville, uh, which became Chestnut Lodge Sanitarium, and, uh, and spend a weekend um, during the season. So there, there were just, uh, it really totally opened up um, Montgomery County to um, anything your imagination should go. And of course, the developments are the ones, um, and, and a pretty good hint is that any town that ends in the word uh, park um is going to be or any any subdivision also is going to be one of these vintage yes and the up up county people would uh, let out rooms in their houses it was first airbnb mm -hmm. <laughs> during the summer as well as they built uh hotels or turned their whole house into a hotel um for the summer and some of those are still standing yes some of those particular specific houses mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, someone asks, when was the Georgetown Branch Rail Line created and what stations were on it in Silver Spring? Well, the Georgetown Branch branched off, let's see, in between Linden and Forest Glen, or right at Linden, actually. And it never had any stops except, I believe it had Bethesda, yeah. So it was a, always a freight line. It was always a single track. It didn't carry passengers. Uh, where was Tusca, excuse me, Tuscarora? Was that in Montgomery County? No, Tuscarora is in Frederick County, and it was a town that existed for a long time. It was originally called Licksville. It was uh, back in the early 1800s, was a, uh, a big slave trading town. Um, they pro prohibited uh, slave trading uh, in Rockville and in Washington, D.C. And so they moved up to Frederick County, the slave traders. Of course, only domestic trades after 1808. There was no more importing of, of people to enslave from Africa after 1808. Okay. Um, oh, it's, uh, let me add to that. It's called Tuscarora because the Tuscarora Indians uh, lived there. They came up, there was a, just north of the Monocacy River, there was an Indian trading post run by Jacques Chartier, a Frenchman, married to uh, an Indian woman, and he ran that trading post for many years. The Tuscaroras were doing, driven out of North Carolina. And they settled there for a couple of generations, actually. And that's how it's got the name Tuscarora. There is a, um, a hot springs there, which is kind of secret. Nobody knows about it. It's on pipe land. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, do you, it, has there been any, like, um, let's see, how do I ask? How, has there been any research done on, the actual quantified benefits to the up county area. So do we know how beneficial the railroads were to the area, I guess? Is, is there any answer to that question? Well, I can think you can see by the, the prosperity of the farmers. Of course, uh, the dairy farming is um, pretty much extinct now. Uh, we've transferred over to other kinds of farming um, but it, I, if just think of what Montgomery County would look like without the train, if it would still be mainly agricultural, and we wouldn't have the prosperity that most people experience. I mean, this is one of the richest counties in the nation. So, 
um, the train actually had a lot to do with that. I'm going to say I'm going to say also um, it's a benefit to students. Uh, in the up county area before so many high schools were built, um, students would come down to um, high schools in Rockville first and then Gaithersburg as well um, on the train. Um, and um, that certainly en enabled them to do that. So kind of along the same lines, um, are the railroads still economically viable and is the mark subsidized? <laughs> uh good, good question i think i think maybe we someone else might answer that um i i can tell you that um we are we are dealing with mark and csx um for the excursion on may 29th and um we are um um paying to um, use the tracks and to um, entice the workers to help run the trains on memorial day so they well, seem to be this, doing fine. Yeah, Mark is a great benefit to the community for uh, getting people, um, north, you know, down to Washington, down to Rockville, Silver Spring areas. And it has a great ridership. Um, I think that last, uh, last slide that I showed, uh, so they uh, had the number of people on the train, but um, these days, but of course, the CSX freight is what takes over and the commuters are always complaining because sometimes the freight train needs to get into Washington and they have to wait um, on the siding there at uh, Silver Spring usually for a while. These freight trains are two miles long and they're double-decker trains. Now they've raised all the bridges, um, lowered the tunnels. So uh, these double-decker trains can get through and it is all kinds of goods going on that train I can tell you because I live near the track so I can see them <clears throat> okay uh, a lot of questions asking about why the do we know why or so sorry two very two very similar questions do we know why the Washington Grove station was demolished and when was it demolished well, the Washington Grove is celebrating their 150th anniversary because they, those Methodists were pretty savvy and bought the land right as the train was being built. But um, I think somebody from Washington Grove could answer that better. I've done some research on it, but I really don't know when it was demolished or how it was demolished. But there is a lot of research going on in Washington Grove right now for the uh, for their bicentennial. I'm sorry, sesquicentennial. <laughs> yeah, hard to say word there. Um, all right. So um, another couple questions asking about um, what happened to Clopper, Waring, and Brown stations. Do we know well, anything about the that? Brown station is now Metropolitan Grove. And I don't know why they changed the name, <laughs> but um, but that was a uh, milk stop um, just north of Gaithersburg. And uh, the same thing, these were, a lot of them were milk stops. The Clopper station was uh, just a milk stop. It didn't have a, a station, only a uh, shelter. So uh, that's, what was the other one? Clopper, Brown, uh, Clopper, Waring, and Brown. Yeah, Waring was the same thing. Um, when they start stop shipping milk because uh, they, they stopped uh, milk stopped being popular, and um, so the cattle, the dairy farms, left. They disappeared and turned into organic farming or growing flowers and things like that. And you have to imagine most of these as small frame um, buildings that um, the um, the railroad was not keeping up if people weren't using them, if the ridership wasn't enough, or if the if the um, you know the the agricultural interest wasn't enough. So they would they would close them frequently, and and um, 
the, the milk producers would go to a nearby place, you know. Yeah, just well, evolved. I, I, yeah. I have to make the point too that um, these were small farms, small dairy farms. And the dairy farming now has been taking over, taken over by industrial dairy farms. People still drink mi milk and eat cheese, but um, the small dairy farms can't make it anymore. They don't compete. They can't compete with the big industrial farms. Okay. Um, can you tell us something about the Kensington Station? It, it's still in operation. Are there efforts being made to keep it active for the future? I'll take I'll take that Kensington is is very active and if you go on the website of uh, kensingtonhistory.org or go to um, Montgomery Preservation website you will see all the things that they are doing um, for this 150th because it is the town's 150th as well it is there because of the um, because of the railroad. Um, and the town um, being a, uh, an incorporated, um, you know, self-contained, self-governing town for the most part um, is very much in on this. Um, and I'll just mention that there is a new brewery that is opening up, uh, the Baby Cat Brewery, which is um, inviting people to come in before, um, well, uh, you know, all of Memorial Day weekend. There are a lot of things going on in, in Kensington, but there, there are things going on before and after that as well. So yes, the station is right in the center um, and it's used every day by commuters. It's used by the town for, for various um, events and programs and entertainment and, and uh, community um, gatherings. It's the really good news. Okay. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the excur excursion train? Is it going to be a steam engine, a historical engine, or is it going to just be a traditional, or sorry, traditional, excuse me, a more modern uh, engine to run that, that trip? It's a marked train. <laughs> so uh, steam engines just aren't, you can't get them anymore. If you If you really must have a steam, you go to Western Maryland or West Virginia. Um, for short excursions, um, but this is our home territory. Um, the Mark train will be accommodating uh, some double deckers, some some not. It'll be a nice, um, pleasant um, train for families, for people of all ages, uh, with um, handicapped access. Uh, time in in Brunswick, which is the um, the uh, farthest north that will go on this line, um, and boarding at uh, six different the potential for boarding at six different places along the line. You choose which way that when you when you reserve your tickets on Eventbrite or um, uh, uh, you will ask be asked where you're going to be boarding. And uh, in uh, Brunswick, there's Brunswick Museum, which has a model train of this line. And so it's very interesting to see all these handcrafted little buildings uh, that were along the the Metropolitan Branch Line. And yeah. um, there'll be an excursion guide as well. Yeah. OK. Um, someone's, uh, someone says, it looks like the path of the railroad pretty much follows the watershed boundary that runs down the middle of the county. Why was that path chosen? Or excuse me, was that why the path was chosen? So does it follow the, the watershed intentionally? No, the watershed, uh, it crosses the watershed. The watershed runs uh, two of them, Bars Ridge and then the Ridley Ridge that goes from Leytonsville to Vethersburg. So that's the, the dividing line is um, actually line running from um, uh, through Leytonsville, the highest point in the county in Barnesville. Anyway, it, that's why these engineers were so challenged because they had to go so far up. Um, if the, the original line did go the from the original Metropolitan Company went closer to the river, but, um, but this line kind of goes straight, cuts straight diagonally across the county. Okay, um, so someone says the impressive triple triple stone arch wearing viaduct was built in 1906. 
Uh, what type of ridge preceded it? Was it a trestle? Can you talk a little bit more about that? It, it was a wood uh, trestle um, and um, then a steel trestle and the same over the Little Seneca Creek on the north side of Germantown. But that one was replaced by a fill, a dirt fill and with a culvert going below it. And there were several dirt fills along the line. Another one is at Rock Creek. So they didn't bother with building a, a viaduct in those places. They just filled the whole um, uh, cross crossover with dirt. And uh, the, it, the trestle uh, Germantown, um, just north of Germantown uh, over Little Seneca Creek, I've heard, was used in several uh, early movies. I haven't found one yet, but if you uh, if you find one of those movies using the trestle, our trestle, just uh, let me know. Okay, um, and we are we are at three oh six, so I'm I'm going to start to wrap up. I do want to ask one more question, um, and I apologize to everyone who uh, whose questions I did not get to. I am so sorry. There's a lot of them here, um, but we are we are after three o'clock here. So, um, when was uh, the commuter when was the commuter line racially integrated? When were Black Americans allowed to ride on the commuter trains, and were uh, the train cars integrated as well? Well, we're still doing research on that. <laughs> it's a it's a difficult problem to answer, and. Um, the, we do know that they were probably uh, separated. They were integrated. I mean, the, the African Americans could ride the train, and some of them from the up county rode the train to high school in Rockville, but they most likely had to ride on the back um, car. So what the what these uh, major companies such as the railroads would do, uh, movie theaters did the same thing, for example, they would respect the laws, and they would have to, of whatever jurisdiction they were they were in. So when we talk about um, desegregation of, uh, of schools, of public facilities and so on, we're talking in, in Maryland and in Montgomery County specifically, um, although the railroad you know, passes through more than one county, um, you're talking about respecting those, those rules. So um, early 60s is, is probably a good general um, uh, date to use for um, integration of the, the commuter lines. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and wrap things up there. Um, I think can you remind us again where people can go to get uh, tickets for for this? Uh, if you still have the um, the the um, uh, URL yeah. on the screen, it's www.montgomerypreservation.org. Okay, well, as I mentioned, we will have a recording of this presentation available next week, and um, I do also hope that you will visit our. Uh, website and and help contribute to our Save Your Voices campaign as we do have our, our batching uh, challenge going on right now. Um, and we really appreciate your support. All right, uh, Eileen and Susan, thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. And I hope everyone will go check out, uh, get a ticket for, for the excursion here. So thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.